It's great to know about these uh, uh, rating uh, websites and agencies that help nav- help us navigate um, uh, that terrain so we don't just um, make a contribution to make ourselves feel good, but actually um, something that will do best and not, ju- not just um, uh, give us a good feeling. Uh, we, we both uh, knew a student here at Wesley named Kennedy Odede and, and, yes. uh, and Jessica Posner, who started now some years ago already a, a group called Shining Hope for Communities, uh, which uh, started with a, a small school for girls in Kibera in Kenya. And over the years, the school's gotten a little bit bigger, and of course they've added this uh, health clinic uh, because... Moms bring the girls to school, and that's a great time to get them the drugs they need if, uh, for various uh, illnesses, especially HIV/AIDS, that that uh, plague this population. And I know one of the great questions that um, that they were faced with is is uh, is local knowledge. Kennedy Odede is from Kibera, and that made a big difference, I think, in the success of the program. That Jessica had worked there already, and they've learned from the people. They didn't try to come in with outside knowledge and impose it. But now the challenge for a group like Shining Hope for Communities is can what they've learned be scaled? Uh, they're now they're working with different organizations to see could other uh, organizations mimic what they've done, probably adapting it to other local knowledges and other communities. I know you're familiar with this work as well. I like that you mentioned how Kennedy came from the community mm-hmm. um, because one of the other points I wanted to make about facilitating yeah. um, our approach, um, you know, the, the extreme poor and their, uh, their ability to raise themselves out of poverty is just that. We need to listen. We need to be yes. able to know what it is that they perceive as their needs and 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 their situation, um, and I think that that's one of the keys to success yeah. for 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 the for Shafco for the Shining Hope for Communities yeah. is that they've really been able to have their ears to the ground, understand what will work in that really particular context, mm-hmm. and and you're absolutely right. Now now that they've really found some success, actually a lot of success yes. in what they've been able to do, and now that they actually have a plan for scaling within that community, mm-hmm. adding grade levels mm-hmm. to the school on a regular basis, expanding to other spheres, providing, you know, clean water, right. providing health facilities as well. You know, there is that question of, well, can this be scaled to other communities? Yeah. My, my advice to them, and, and I've actually mentioned it to them before, yeah. is, you know, that they should, you know, try to find those kinds of local contacts as right. well. You need to have that that connection um, within the community and that demand coming from within the community yeah. in order for the community to have ownership in these in these in these activities um, and and with that ownership to really make sure that it is something that's sustainable. Yeah. Um, you know, I can my work on water and sanitation in Ghana just to bring us back there very yeah. briefly. Um, I one of the things that we learned right away was that a past method of of providing aid did not work, which was that the development community tried to drill boreholes all over right. West Africa, but they went in without really communicating with women in the village, right. who are the primary people that get water. Right. They did it without really thinking about how to include the community, and right. so these boreholes were drilled. They were functioning, but they would eventually stop functioning. A part would be needed or yeah. missing or, you know, they would get rusted or sometimes people would just not use them right. because they didn't know what they were there for. Yeah. Um, and, and that was a big problem. You have to have that local ownership. You have to have a way to find, um, to, 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 to include local knowledge in the planning and in the development of these projects. Uh, and without doing that, I think, Ultimately, most of them become unsustainable. That's why my task was actually more community organizing as yeah. a volunteer. Yeah, interesting. Um, you know, it was about forming committees that actually still last. I mean, I went to, when I was back there this summer, I sat down in a meeting with the same individuals um, that were on the committee when I was there more than 10 years ago, and they were making the decision on what their contributions would be to a new piped water system, huh. which is great. It's going to be the first time they have piped water, and it's, it's, now, it's now going to happen. And those institutions, those little kind of community organizing institutions, um, really can play a big role in, in, in the long-term development prospects, I think, for a lot of these communities as well. So, once again, politics and economics, uh, they can be jointly effective. Sure. Uh, and, and 
And I, it sounds like um, a takeaway for us uh, for this course is that inclusion makes an enormous difference. Absolutely. Um, and you know, aid will be successful when it's not just foreign, but when it it, it taps into these local knowledges, when it's inclusive, um, and when it's owned by by the people who are going to be responsible for this economic development. No, absolutely. No, the local knowledge can generate. All sorts of unforeseen dynamics. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there's the story of the uh, um, uh, of the of the individual in India, and I'm, I'm, his name is escaping me. Who um, put a computer out there? Yeah. Just wanted to see what kids would do. Yeah. And before he knew it, they were teaching themselves how to use yeah. the computer. They were teaching each other how to, you know, math and language yeah. skills, and it, it really generated its own kind of dynamics. Yeah. And we don't know how locals are going to use resources, and it's important to include them if we're going to uh, try to move forward in that way. Well, you know, hope of this class is that uh, we stimulate thinking for lots of people in lots of parts of the world and that they participate in their own communities to, uh, to make a difference in a positive way to deal with some of these very difficult challenges. Mike, thanks so much for talking with me today. It's a pleasure. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks. Bye-bye. Yeah. One of the organizations most concerned with dealing with extreme poverty is the United Nations. And the United Nations Foundation was part of the uh, Social Goods Summit in New York in the fall of 2013. And Jan Eliasson uh, gave a very striking talk about some of the basic needs in sanitation for those suffering from extreme poverty. And he, he made the point that concerted effort on a particular part of the problem can have extraordinarily powerful reverberating effects. And so I'd like to to listen to his talk about about toilets uh, at the Social Goods Summit because attacking one specific point in the chain of of the cycle of of poverty can actually have really important effects uh, uh, to help people move out of uh, that cycle of oppression and suffering. We're honored to have with us the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Jan Eliasson. Thank you much. Thank you very much, Erin. Great to be with you. Uh, it's actually I am lucky to meet you because you can convey the message much more powerfully than we in our generation knew. So I count on you. This week is what we call the crazy week in the UN. Uh, So uh, the science of cloning isn't advanced enough for us. I need to be in several places at the same time. But this is important for me to come to you. I could easily, for you, present the whole UN agenda. I won't. Peace, development, human rights. Without peace, there is no development. Without development, there is no peace. And none of the above without respect of human rights. Three pillars on which everything rests, both for the international community and a good nation. But I will talk about a microcosm of this agenda. And I hold this microcosm in my hand, a glass of water. Water is development. Water is human rights. It's a human right to have water. And water is peace. And I'll make these points. It's first on development. This glass of New York tap water is a luxury, a dream, for 768 million people around the world. 2.5 billion people don't have sanitation, which is a euphemism for toilets. 1.1 million people practice open defecation. I'm breaking a lot of taboos here, don't I? 22 nations. This problem of sanitation primarily is the reason why, and now lean back and take this figure in, 2,000 children under the age of five are dying every day. And this is, to me, one of the biggest shames that we uh, continue to accept in the world. I was in Darfur, I was in Somalia. I saw children dying in front of me, out of diarrhea, dysentery, dehydration, cholera. And I said to myself, we've got to get rid of this horrible problem. Still, believe it or not, this is the most lagging of the Millennium Development Goals. 
We need to speed up that work, and I am starting our campaign on behalf of Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, a call for action on sanitation. And I count on governments, I count on civil society, I count on all of you, count on the private sector, research and science, to really make their contributions. Because if we do sanitation right, then we have great progress in extreme poverty, child mortality, maternal health, uh, gender equality, and again, ed education. Because it has such a tremendous multiplication effect. And it is the most lagging. So we need all the efforts uh, from you and others to make this, make, speed up this implementation. Also, it's good business. People who are, don't have the problems of health are more productive. Girls can go to school. The girls don't have to stay home with the, the uh, children and so forth. So it's, it's, a, it's a huge issue to move on the sanitation issue. Then, of course, there is something related to this which could perhaps appeal to your sense of innovation. What do we do with waste management? We have a tremendous trend in this world of urbanization. 60% of humanity will in the next five years live in cities. Mostly it's poor people that move into poor countries, capitals, and then they, or big cities, and then they create slums, and that's where you have problems of infrastructure and no sanitation facilities. We have some outbreaks of cholera in such areas now. In fact, my experience is that it's easier sometimes to deal with this problem in the villages, in the countryside, than it is in the big cities. So waste management. 80% of the water from industry and from human settlements is, un is not, is not uh, cleaned. It is, is goes out in the, in the uh, rivers and lakes and destroys the environment. And then, of course, the last point, I've mentioned now the relationship to human rights, development, but to peace. Believe it or not, when I was mediating in the Darfur cri crisis, uh, there was, in fact, in fact, something absolutely horrible that I saw. It was the, some, some villages where the enemy, the militia, had thrown a dead dog or a dead lamb in the well, and that was the way to chase away the population. I say this horrible example, I mention this example because it was, is an example of water now being a scarce resource that could be used either as a reason for conflict, in this case, in Darfur, or a reason for cooperation. If we don't have that resource available for us, then there's going to be fight about it. So we have to develop now methods of making sharing of waters, or sharing of water and, and uh, making sure that we don't cause conflicts about it. You Right now there is a diplomatic problem arising between Egypt and Ethiopia because of the dams built, planned to be built in Ethiopia that would have an effect on agriculture in Egypt. So here is water, I mentioned this, a microcosm for so crucial for human dignity, for development and for peace. So I, I really appeal to you to use your sense of innovation and help us move this process forward. And what, what can you then do for us? First of all, I think you can help us take away this taboo. This taboo about uh, toilets and sanitation. I finished a speech in the United Nations. Instead of the last sentence being, I want us all to have a life in dignity for all, I said, I, we, we need a life with toilets for all. And I think the interpreters got a bit confused. <laughs> and my, my, latest, uh, my latest contribution to diplomatic discourse is open defecation. So, <laughs> so whatever you can do to, to break down that taboo and really look at it straight, straightforwardly and do something about it is very helpful. And you with the social media and all the me methods that you have to also raise that awareness is, of, of course, extremely important. And then those of you who have engineered dreams or, or something of that nature, if you could think about methods of having more of a circulation so that we have make fertilizer because we can't you know, use four or five liters of water every time in water-scarce uh, environments. And if you can think about purification of water and also installation so that we don't use so much water uh, for what we call brown water in the agriculture, we have a circulation pattern. Whatever you can do to help us with innovation in this area is going to be absolutely important. And by that, you will contribute to the achievement of the Millennium Goal, improving this most lagging of goals, and having this multi multiplication effect so that we can indeed, what I hope to God we will do, we will, should decide that by 2030, we should finish extreme poverty in the world. And that should be our joint commitment. Thank you very much.
the importance of uh, covered toilets uh, to, to just get down to brass tacks in dealing with poverty and how so many people, especially in rural areas, have no access to proper sanitation, and that leads to all kinds of other problems. Just a few more uh, facts about what we know uh, about e extreme poverty. 40% of the extreme poor are Ill illiterate, uh, uh, so they can't uh, uh, read basic uh, uh, texts. Um, they have uh, uh, trouble uh, communicating anything uh, that, except uh, orally. Um, and um, that is a good... Uh, uh, going to really restrict their access to markets uh, uh, and, and to uh, trade. Uh, the, the, it's to compare that with about, I think, less than 16% of the world more generally would uh, be uh, illiterate. And here, one of the more heartbreaking statistics, and there are a lot of statistics here that are, are, are deeply troubling. 17% uh, of children under five in developing countries are malnourished. 17% 17% of uh, children under five are malnourished in developing countries. Um, and uh, 1.8 million every year die of diseases linked to the diarrhea, uh, uh, which is, of course, linked to the sanitation issues, linked to the, pure, the, the water issues. 1.8 million people every year, uh, and 90% of those people are under five years old. And the great majority of these deaths are preventable. That, that's really the, isn't that the, the crux of it for us in this week? It's just that we know how to prevent these diseases and our knowledge is not being effectively translated into action. That's the issue, right? And, and, and many people, you know, they'll be critical of aid or they'll be supportive of aid or they'll, they'll you know, blame the West for, for its neocolonial practices or they'll blame the developing world for its own uh, being mired in, 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 in poverty traps or in corruption or poor government. Uh, there, there are lots of arguments on all sides of these issues. We're not going to start them all out this week. But I, I think what's really driving our interest in this issue is that we know, technologically speaking, scientifically speaking, we know how to eradicate some of these diseases, especially the ones linked to diarrhea. Um, but we don't know how to connect our knowledge to the most effective actions in parts of the world that suffer the greatest. And that is what is getting our attention and, 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 and making some of um, the, the most uh, impressive organizations and thinkers in this area uh, try to come up with new strategies for connecting our knowledge to more effective policies in the field. So, um, just a few more statistics because it is important to have some sense of scale on these issues. Uh, in 2010, uh, in East Asia and the Pacific, about 12.5% of people lived in extreme poverty. 12.5%. In Europe and Central Asia, less than 1%, about 0.7%. In Latin America and the Caribbean, about 5.5% of people live in extreme poverty. In the Middle East and North Africa, even less, 2.5%, 2.4%. And of course, in the two big regions we've said where extreme poverty is most persistent in South Asia, 31% of the population living in extreme poverty, almost a third. And in Sub-Saharan Africa, 48.5%, so almost half of the population living on less than $1.25 a day. Now, when I say that, and I, you know, I move to this rubric that we're using in this class, why we should care, I feel a little sheepish, really, because, I mean, it seems kind of obvious why we should care. Our fellow human beings are all over the planet, and, and, and you know, in hundreds of millions, uh, uh, are living in conditions that deprive them of, of, of so... Uh, of course, it's suffering, first of all, and then deprive them of opportunity to reach uh, their potential. And that's why we should care. It's morally offensive, uh, it's, and it's something we can do about it. We'll talk about more of that later. But there's also um, just, you know, when you think about this in, in particular terms, 9 million children uh, every year, 9 million children every year die before their fifth birthday. 
That's, that's shocking, right? Um, and, you know, some of the studies show you would be more shocked if I told you the sto- story of Annalise, who dies at age four, and give you a whole story about her particular life in her village with her parents. Um, uh, I'm not going to do that here. We have, you know, we have lots of uh, material we can show you online that will show you the results of, of, of extreme poverty on children um, through specific cases, particular people. Uh, but nine million children die under five every year. A woman in sub-Saharan Africa has a one in 30 chance of dying while giving birth. One in 30. In the developed world, that's one in five, five and a half thousand. One in 30 compared to one in five and a half thousand. Those are huge challenges. But we have a history of dealing with these challenges, and um, there are a lot of smart people out there that we will be reading this week and listening to who think we have some knowledge now of how to deal with these. And um, uh, you know, what, what, another reason why we should care about this, in addition to just the human suffering that's entailed, uh, as Jim Kim says in the video from the Social Good Summit, one of the reasons we should care is that you will not have peace you will not get rid of terrorism. You will not get rid of uh, vicious social unrest that seems, that seems to many people senseless. You won't get rid of those things as long as you have the persistence of extreme poverty. Extreme poverty is a breeding ground for violence that uh, seems to have no political direction, for terrorism that seems um, uh, almost nihilistic in its intensity. Extreme poverty gives rise to so many other evils in the world um, and until we uh, deal with extreme poverty more effectively, uh, we will have to continue to deal with these secondary and tertiary effects uh, of uh, people uh, whose lives um, uh, um, are lived in in this um, in, in the, this condition of of, of um, deprivation. So, some of the basic facts, some of the basic uh, and depressing uh, facts about the, the scale of these issues. Um, I, I, want, I want to say that, uh, that there is an enormous energy bef- behind a movement to end poverty. And it has been going on for, for several decades. And there are some real success stories. Um, I, I think what's clear right now, and I, I hesitate to say because I guess in some ways it seems like a no-brainer, is that the most important thing we know about dealing with extreme poverty is that we need economic growth. And now you may say, well, duh, <laughs> of course, Roth, that's, our, that's what you come to us to, with uh, all the way from Wesleyan University. It's like saying we need food when we're hungry. Aha, it's, it, it, it's different from that in the sense that we know these people are, if people are hungry, we can give them food. We know they are cold, we can give them blankets. And we should, and we do. But what we also know now is that blankets and food are not enough. We need to at the give people to help them, them themselves generate economic growth because the only sustainable end to poverty is one through economic growth and not just through the alleviation of immediate suffering. We have to deal with suffering because when you're suffering, it's hard to actually be productively uh, economically, uh, economically productive. <laughs> when you're suffering, it's hard to, to make the right market decisions. When you're deprived of all these basic necessities, it's hard to d- create new markets it, or to grow your crops properly or to educate your children or to clean the water that you're using. But what's important for, 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 as a lens for this is that it's not just about the reduction of suffering. It's about the reduction of suffering in such a way that people can get on the ladder of economic growth. Because if they don't get on the ladder of economic growth, then their suffering will return. And we may feel better about sending them blankets and food and all the rest. We may feel better, but we actually haven't addressed the problem, which is to create conditions or help them create conditions for economic growth.